Hello friends, thank you for joining me again today. It's a day of touch-ups, just like the one I'm working on right now, which is one of the paintings that I did for the World Gig Festival, which is already hard to believe, hard to believe, two months ago, back in the first weekend of November in lovely little Wilson, <laughs> Wilson, North Carolina, for the Whirly Gig Festival, which I have participated in 12 or 13 years in a row. I think it's 13 now. I think I missed the very first one, and then they, they found me in time for their second. All right, let's get official. This is Daily Art Adventure number 807. Woohoo! <laughs> Every day is a celebration. Whoops, isn't it? Well, let me show you, before I paint this, let me show you what I've done. I went down and picked up some of the paintings that I've already finished. So here's the first one that I touched up today. This is... Uh, obviously a wedding painting. It's the wedding painting that I finished uh, this past weekend during a bridal show. Had a great time. And this is Kelsey and her husband. I thought I was going to touch up the whole painting, but honestly I got it out and said, nope, don't need to touch anything except for the bride and groom. So I, that this is the only one that I did detailed faces and I let me see if I st oh yeah I still have it here the old the old trick did my old trick if some of you have seen me do many times before I took a a picture of my painting with with my camera with my phone picture of the painting and then pulled up my reference photo side by side then both of them I flopped reverse because when you see a mirror image of something you can see your mistakes better so this is my mirror image and I went whoa several things so basically I needed to tilt the man's the groom's head forward down a little bit worked on both of their faces quite a bit and really the their arms and hands and a little bit of her shoulder and that was it Actually, now that I'm looking at it, I realize, <laughs> hang on, <laughs> this is the way it goes, isn't it? When you're painting, every time you see it, you go, oh, wait a minute. I've, I've failed to uh, fix something on his shoulder here. There we go. <laughs> there, so you got, <laughs> you got to watch me do one stroke. So that was my first, uh, whoops, my first task today. Um... Not necessarily in this order, so let me show you the the uh, second painting upon which I embarked today. And this this is a well, it's not going to fit on my easel. Sorry. Hmm. Hang on a second. How am I going to do this? I'm not. I'm going to just move you guys, turn you around. So bear with me for a minute. <laughs> so there is uh, the painting of Charleston, South Carolina that I'm planning to enter into a competition at the end of this week. And on this one, I glazed the whole thing, a little bit of color everywhere. And then punched these lights, all these white lights, a little bit, and a little bit on that windshield. That's about it. So, about 40 minutes of work on that, and I'm happy to declare that officially, officially finished. I've been working off and on on that painting for months, which is a totally new experience for me. Um, here's another one. This was, um, whoops, hang on. Let me this was um, my the painting I did downtown on 
New Year's Eve. I'm trying to get an angle for you there. All right. So this is the painting I did now, 36 by 48, New Year's Eve. The lady who bought it is coming tomorrow to pick it up. I glazed that and did a little bit of light touch up. And then finally the last one. Can you believe I had the nerve to do all this painting without you? Some people. <laughs> that I would actually paint without you watching. You should be, you should be offended. And this is the one that I'm most happy with, that I spent the most time on it today and, and made to basically lightened it up a good deal. And that, that's it, just everything you see there that's light, I touched today and quite a bit of the mid-tones as well. I touched the, the shadow side of most of these buildings and the sunny side. So that one, likewise, I'll be entering into the same competition. This is sort of an Otzi painting. <laughs> this is maybe, maybe, maybe the kind of painting, again, you dare not, you dare not hold your breath when you're entering a competition. Two kind of, two kind of judges in the world, those who love my paintings and those who don't know a damn thing about painting. <laughs> uh, that's a quote. Um, so back then to the task at hand. Hello, Warren. Hello, Barbara. Um, so what I'm hoping to do on, now, now I have uh, three large paintings from the Whirly Gig Festival. They were, when I painted them, some of you understand. All right, are we back? Are we back? All right, are we back? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're not back. All right, thank you, Barbara. Um, I did, I did uh, four, uh, paint, three paintings for the World of Geek Festival, um, all on a, essentially an eight by 10 foot canvas, which is my, my large equipment. And uh, I essentially filled up an eight by 10 foot canvas in two days. Which is hauling. <laughs> I think most, most of you, if you're a painter, you go, that's that's fast. And it was three different paintings on the one canvas. Anyway, so part of the charm of my festival paintings in, in that context is their spontaneity, their speed, for want of a better word, term. And I, I really don't want to violate that. I don't want to, now that I have time, I don't want to go in and, uh, change that. In fact, normally, as you know, on day two of a painting, I would glaze the whole thing and I, I seriously considered doing that um, with this painting and with these paintings. And then just decided, no, for one thing, <laughs> I'm not being paid enough to do that. <laughs> and for another, it would, it, 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 I'm just going to stick with the the essential character. I'm sorry, I've used that word too many times now in one, one broadcast. I'll try to avoid using it again. <laughs> um, so I'm just, I'm just going to do a little bit on all, th and I've got three of them to do, and they're all fairly large. I have no idea how big this is. I mean, I, I knew it when I sent it. I had a friend stretch them for me, so I did all the measuring and so on. So I just, I think I would call what I'm doing right now, I would label it the sparkle layer. 
which for me comes even after. It's one of my newest uh, developments in my painting journey. To go back into the painting one last time after all the glazes, after all the um, broken color, everything, after the final edits, and just come back one more time and sparkle it up just a little bit. So that's what I'm going to, going to try to do here, is just keep it to basically the lightest values. I did. You saw me do light blue up there, and I'm doing white, warm white, off white here. And of course, I'm not going to carry this out, you know, to the far edges of the painting. I'm going to focus primarily here. And I'm going to try to use this, the same brushes over and over and over. By the way, I failed to mention when I was doing um, the Charleston church steeple painting and the, the gray pale painting, both of those, both of those paintings have some extremely slow drying layers on them already. So I actually went to my local art store the other day and intentionally bought for the first time that I know of some slow dry medium. I have no idea what to I mean <laughs> how long is how long is that gonna keep keep it? You know, how long is that gonna take to dry? I would think, uh, certainly a week I would think. Anyway, I'm of course trying to avoid any problems with fat over lean, with getting things mixed up. And that would be awful at this stage of those paintings where there's already so much invested in them, so much time for them to come out cracking. So um, I used on both of those, I used slow dry and I certainly hope it's slow enough that's that's all that's all I'm hoping I hope it's slow enough on this painting I'm using straight liquid because um, everything on this canvas of course it was done in one day so everything on this canvas is fast dry so I certainly don't have to worry about it very much. Don't have to worry about fat over lean. We've talked about this before, just in case, but in case anybody new watches this. Um, the old expression, fat over lean, which is still spoken by people, teachers, I presume, somebody's keeping that thing alive, should, should be abandoned completely. Um, that is a, a holdover from an earlier era, as I like to say, that's 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 how my daddy painted. Because back in the day, now, don't get me wrong, there 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 have been people in the Middle Ages, going, artists who concocted crazy mediums, you know, crazy recipes of their own. Uh, William Bouguereau, 1890s. It's not Middle Ages, but you know, that's 130 years ago now. William Bouguereau um, had a unique formula. So people have been making up unusual formulas for centuries. But generally speaking, in the middle of the 20th century, pretty much all oil painters, except for the obscure, I don't know what to call oddball geniuses, Everybody used liquid. I mean, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Every, <laughs> that's funny. That's Freudian. Everybody used linseed oil. That was just that was just a given. If you if you're oil painting, and you're using a medium, that medium is linseed oil. Okay, that's what I mean. That's that's the way my daddy painted. By the way, every once in a while, because I virtually never use it, linseed oil. I haven't for decades now. I'm sure. Uh, but every time I get a whiff of it, it actually it actually rushes me back to my dad's 
on my dad painting because the the, the uh, smell takes me back there almost instantly, um, which is sweet. Uh, yes, sweet smell, yeah, and and sweet emotion. Um, anyway, that so that that expression, fat over lean, harkens back to an earlier age when virtually everybody was using linseed oil. Linseed oil is a very slow drying medium. Yes, I thought about buying it the other day when I was looking for a slow medium, but I just was a little bit too like, eh, I don't know, I don't trust it. <laughs> So I got the Galkid slow dry instead. Anyway, the, what people are trying to say when they espouse this principle, fat over lean, what they really ought to be saying is slow dry over fast dry. Because I've actually had people ignorantly argue that if you add liquid to your paint, you're making it fatter, which just shows the complete misunderstanding of, of what's going on. Whoops, let's see if this is my wife calling in. Nope. My wife, I'll pick up for everybody else. You leave a message. So there we go. Fat over lean, eh, no, slow dry over fast dry. That's what you care about. You want the underneath layers to dry quickly. Some of you are falling asleep because we've talked about that so many times. Sorry about that. Okay, just a little bit of sparkle. I like to think I'm almost finished here. I, I, pushed the energy here. I'm going to come in with some green. I'm just about running out of brushes. <laughs> By the way, this is, <laughs> speaking of which, this is one downside of painting uh, with two hands. <laughs> yes, guess what? I, I dirty twice as many brushes as, as people who paint with one hand. For every color that I put together, I, uh, I mix up I, you know, I use two brushes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at, okay, so at the moment I have four pairs of brushes, blue, red, yellow, white, and uh, I'm going to start green and then I'm, now I'm running out of places to put them. That's not going to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> the show must go on. I mean, the painting must go on. So I'm mixing up now a um, pale. Uh, I was going to say yellow green, but it's actually turning out to be more of a, a little bit more. Of the, <laughs> I'm using contaminated colors on purpose and not being careful, not being fussy on purpose. So it's a little bit of a very pale olive green. Yeah, that works nice. Now, some of you might be discerning that I am in fact breaking a rule. I am indeed right now. With each of the last four colors that I've put down, I've mixed up a color. Like, here's my palette, right? So here's my blue, yellow, brown, reds, and then green. And I'm basically just mixing up one pile of color and, and slapping that, that color down across the painting, which your alarm bell should go off. You should say, hey, you tell us we're not supposed to do that. And, and I told you right. I did tell you right. You're not supposed to do that. Why? Um, because the, the human eye, without the, without the possessor of that eye, <laughs> even consciously, um, you know, art, uh, art viewers consciously pick up on very, very, very little of what the artist is doing. But if the artist is good, the artist is 
messing with the the mind of the viewer with even though the viewer doesn't even realize it anyway uh, the mind of the viewer will pick up on that redundancy the eye will pick up on the fact that there are the same color is peppered if you will across the canvas and generally speaking that is not a that's a, that's a spice <laughs> that's a peppering that we do not that we do not find attractive because it's redundant um, so that's why most of the time after I have done this peppering <laughs> I will come back and mix up a slightly lighter version of that color and ap apply that on top of what's already there All right that's I hope you're aware of that well I don't think you know if I wanted to take the time it would be better if I would do that it would indeed here's my caveat excuse whatever you want to call it <laughs> um, in a way with with this um, sparkle layer this is in a sense the the lighter version of what was already there does that make sense to you now that's a that's a lame excuse. Please, please, please understand. I I know that I'm speaking lame excuses. It would be better, in a way, if I were to do what I normally do. But I don't have the patience on this particular on these particular paintings. That, that that would make it indeed a more refined painting now here in fact I am doing it right here on this purple on this orange stuff um, but this is one time where I'm just going to be content mostly <sighs> to, to leave that step undone because I'm just doing sparkle. I'm going to go back and do warm white again, just a tiny white with a tiny bit of yellow, usually a Naples yellow or a uh, yellow ochre, usually is my preferred, rather than going to like a, a cad yellow or something like that to warm up my whites. It, that's too yellow in my opinion so I like using something a little bit more subtle so did all that make sense essentially what I'm doing here in this sparkle layer is in fact that is that last lighter last lightest layer even though I'm admitting to you um, it would be better if I if I did it twice but it's a it's a better I'm willing to forego on this particular painting again because the painting does in fact have a certain charm I did take uh, these paintings to my monthly painters group uh, way back in uh, November I believe and I said as you can imagine I said to them I'm gonna I'm gonna touch all these up a little bit and you can tell me if you're if you're an artist if you know artists if you understand artists I said yeah yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna touch them all up and they all said what no right okay because in fact they are responding rightly to the spontaneity the looseness if you will I don't like that word anymore but you know what I mean um, they're responding to the freedom this the energy of the strokes and they don't want me to ruin it and indeed 
I am in danger of ruining it by overworking it. So, uh, so that would be, why am I not going to go back and do lighter? Because there's a mitigating rule. Every rule can be broken. When is a rule broken? When there's a, what I call a mitigating rule. That is an opposite rule, r rule uh, forcing you in the other direction. So in this case, I have two competing rules. One is don't overwork a painting. <laughs> it's not usually stated that way, but it'll do. Don't overwork a painting. And that, that rule is in competition with the one I just stated earlier about don't mix up one color and spread it across the canvas. Instead, after, after you do that, because we almost all do that to some degree, I, I don't know anybody that mixes up a color of paint and then only makes one dot and move, then mixes it up again. I mean, I, I suppose it's possible that that is a very slow painter. <laughs> Anyway, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because there's a contravening or a, uh, another rule in contrast for that one, and it is don't overwork a painting. And and uh, I like the the spontaneous feel. So there you go. There's a lot more sparkle in that painting than there was just a little while ago. I hope there's not too much sparkle. What do we call that? Yeah, dotification. <laughs> and if we if we accidentally engage in dotification, then what do we have to employ? Yeah, anti-dotification. The dreaded anti-dotification. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm done with that one. I think I've got, I brought one more up here. Same, same idea. Same process. Uh, just a smaller painting. Here it is. Yeah, this was the small one of the weekend, 36 by 36. Yeah, beware the dreaded dotification. Yeah, and anti-dotification, what is that? It's uh, any number of things, sometimes simply taking a fan brush and smearing, or a finger or a rag and smearing some of the dots. Well, as a matter of fact, I see you guys chatting at me and I'm sorry I haven't taken any time to pay attention to you yet. Um, in fact, I am going to do some. Hang on. Some <laughs> anti dotification now that I've got it down here on the floor. And I'm gonna pick, pick up a rag. And carefully select, especially out here towards the edges and just, just smear, right? That's pretty easy, right? It's amazing how much dotification I can accomplish in such a short amount of time. All right, good enough. And this goes along with my recent discovery, a recent, one of the most recent evolutionary developments in my painting is uh, make it a practice whenever you, whoops, I need to get this painting lower. Whenever you put a mark down with a brush, Assume, make it your general practice that you're going to manipulate that mark. After you put it down with a brush, it's not a rule, but it's just a general practice. As a matter of course, nor your norm, my norm, will be having put down a mark, I, I then plan to mess up that mark. So that's what you just saw me do ironically on the big painting down there on the floor. All right, so here's the 36 by 36. Hey, let me take a second and read all your chats. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I love, sorry, I took my phone, my phone completely fell on the floor and unplugged a while ago, so that's why I disappeared. Hello, Bobo Pop, good to have you back again. Hello, Delia.
Bobo asks a question. Do I have any rec recommendation for color choices? Wow, let me think about that. Uh, Barbara, the Whirligig paintings go back to the Whirligig Festival. Uh, some of them they sell uh, later in the season um, as fundraisers. Hang on, I'm looking around because I'm trying to find... something I can use for a palette. Here we go. <laughs> Clipboards for me often double as palettes because there's no room on my the palette I've been using for a big pile of liquid. This painting, the one I'm working on right now, now let me ask color. Um, Bobo, you asked about color. Yes, I have recommendations. It is real simple. Transparent, Transparent, transparent. That's it. Get away from the, what is most common in our uh, generation. Anybody that's alive now and has been, anybody who's painted since uh, 1900 until now, most of you, most of our professors, our professors and instructors paint, um, quite opaque. And that's why their colors are dead. <laughs> there are exceptions to this, of course. There's some people who paint live <laughs> colors that are opaque, but their colors would be even more live if they were transparent. So instead of mixing bobo, I'm still on answering your question, instead of making a habit of mixing colors on your palette, Mix your colors on your canvas by piling up. Whew. Hang on, gang. It's, getting, it's a little bit s smelly in here, so bear with me just for a minute while I open a window on this nice, chilly January afternoon and turn on a fan and open a door. So. Whew! So that's all. That's Bobo. That's all I can say is if you if you've already made that transition from the land of opaque to the land of to the magic of transparency, good for you. Half the battle's over. All the only other thing I'll say about color is that every painting should be either mostly a warm painting with cool areas or mostly a cool painting with warm areas. Yep. All right. Hang on just a second. Because I just happened to have a couple paintings right here in my, in my studio. Okay. What is this? Most, is this a warm painting with cool areas or is it a cool painting with warm areas? The answer is B. This is a cool painting with warm areas. All right? So, whoops. You do not want, you do not want a painting that is 50-50. If, if you hold up your painting in front of your peers, and you hold up another one. What is this one? Is this a cool painting with warm areas or a warm painting with cool areas? Again, this is a cool painting with warm areas. The overall, the overall palette is slightly cool kind of debatable on this one, but let me, now here's, here's more typical, way more typical of me. Way more typical palette for most of us. Which, which one is this? This is clearly a warm painting with cool areas. All right, so in other words, you want 60, 40, 75, 25, golden mean, 1 to 1.618 or something you want. So this is a warm painting with cool areas. Got it? So there you go. That's, I, there's so much we, more we could say about color, but that's it. Number one, get away from opaque and get into transparent, which is what you see me doing right now. I'm doing this paint, this particular painting really needed a uh, some glazes on it. It was it was way too washed out 
It's just, it just felt pale to me. So I didn't, don't have any choice but to do glazes. And this is typically what I do, by the way, <laughs> I love doing this at a wedding. Um, when I'm finished with the, uh, the acrylic phase of the painting, the, you know, the guests have enjoyed watching me paint for two hours, maybe hour and a half or so. And they think the painting is lovely and it's all acrylic. And then I switch to oil. And the first thing I do is I put down a mark, something like what you just saw me do there. <laughs> and I can hear, I can hear every time, I can hear gasps <laughs> across the dining hall, across the banquet hall. <laughs> just a little bit of, just a little bit of showmanship, <laughs> not, not too much, pretty subtle. <laughs> it looks so shocking at first. <laughs> and many people tell me afterwards, oh, when I saw you do that, <laughs> I hear that all the time. So I just did um, ultramarine up there, up there and down here. And then in the middle here, I am doing uh, oxide red, transparent oxide red which is a lot like burnt sienna, orangish brown. And I'm sorry, I, I completely left off reading your comments, you guys. Sorry about that. By the way, on the, on the days that I do miss so many comments, I typically go back on my YouTube channel later and read them later. And sometimes I read them to my wife. You guys are so funny and interesting. All right, so do you see how much richer that painting is, I'm not going to waste time cleaning those brushes right now or this palette. Oh, I will wipe this off though. This, I called it a palette. I mean this clipboard. Eventually all my clipboards <laughs> end up, end up having, and then they just look artsy. Not like this one, but they look like, you know, used paint palettes eventually. <laughs> Now, after, after glazing, what comes next? Typically, yeah, lifting, lifting paint out with a rag. And because this, this paint, this canvas has quite a tooth to it, it's a very rough canvas, I'm going ahead and putting um, some Gamsol. On it because I on the rag because I know I I want it to I want the rag to really lift out some stuff pretty pretty aggressively. So I don't know if you can tell what's going on here. One of the requests that was made of me by the uh, by the festival organizers was that I do one painting of the kid zone. So this is a, a bouncy thing, you know, the bunch of kids. I did, I did take a bunch of photographs of, of children. That was creepy. <laughs> there was one alert mother that came up and asked me, who I was and what I was doing and I was I was ready for her. I was glad somebody had the courage to say, what is this guy doing walking around taking pictures of all of our kids? All right, now forgive me. I need to run down the hall and wash my hands uh, to get this gamsol off them. So hang on just a second. I'll be back in just a minute. I do not want to go many minutes with this junk. Still here? 
for those of you who just walked up, um, I had to go wash my hands. I try to keep a bottle of, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? Wet wipes, <laughs> not wet wipes exactly, they smell too much like diapers for me. I wasn't necessarily planning to get into this level of rework here, but it just it just dawned me after having done that glaze. Well, for for one thing, I know that these these pencils smoosh beautifully uh, with with liquid, so. It's a, it's a real treat, as you can see. There, it's a real buttery. And it's like in the olden days when we were kids and you, you colored with colored pencils. I don't know if you ever did this, but I remember we would see our elders. They would lick their pencil and then, right? Because then it would, you'd get a juicier, <laughs> sorry, too much information. You'd get a juicier line. Well, that's the way this feels and it's really just fun. So. So uh, tactile <laughs> is that a word? Um, so satisfying, and, and I, think you, I think you can see that in the, in the line that, that I've left there. Let me zoom in a little bit for you here. Not much. Um, Oh my, I, when I was at the festival back in the first weekend in November, the Whirly Gig Festival, you can look that up if you want, Whirly Gig. It's quite, quite the story, quite an inspiring story. The Whirly Gigs in question here are, some of them 40 or 50 feet tall and weigh literally tons. And they were made by one eccentric dear old man. I had the privilege of meeting several times before he passed away at the age of 95 I believe it was he started making these things when he was 60 and before he died he was literally world famous and he put the town of Wilson North Carolina on the map quite the inspiring story um, this was the they wanted three paintings and this was the last one that I started and I was seriously running out of time when I started this one. I hope it doesn't look like it. Um, but I learned, uh, for me, I learned a really valuable tip or trick. I don't know if this will translate for any of the rest of you or not. Um, so I, I literally I just spit this particular painting out at, at extraordinary speed. Like I did, I don't know, did this whole thing in maybe two hours, something like that. I don't recommend that, but when, it's, when, that's, when that's what's necessary, that's what you do. Um, so it's quite an unfinished painting. But the tip that I learned was, at least for me, um, when, when I'm in a huge, huge hurry like that, um, slip into illustration mode. I don't know if that, that may not communicate anything to you, but um, it was, first of all, it was mostly drawing out of my head, even though I did have a bunch of pictures that I had looked at earlier. It, that is, before I started painting, I had looked at a bunch of pictures, but I, I paid almost no attention to them. Once I started painting, I just started Ill drawing, so to speak. Um, like, like in the third grade sense of the word. You know, I became the, the third grade artist. The third grade artist is the kid who can draw stuff out of his head. Does that make sense? So that's essentially what I did here. I just said, what the heck? I, so I just started drawing kids, uh, relying, as you can see, on instead of looking at photographs or anything, just relying on my own previous learning for anatomy. Um, you know, how come I could draw kids like this? The answer is because at some point, at many points in my past, I've, I've 
studied how to draw children. I studied, uh, I have looked at children and drawn them. I've done the hard work. That's what gave me the freedom to move as fast as I did. Anyway, so right here today, I hope to fix, <laughs> repent of my haste and, and uh, clean this up quite a bit. I'm going to start right here in the, the focal point, the high contrast area, right there. Thankfully, the, the composition is not bad, I think. I think the composition is not bad um, because it's real obvious where I'm, where I'm taking your gaze. The sun is coming in at a low angle from our left, which is, is indeed accurate. That's the way the sun was coming at this particular bouncy toy. So we're looking north and the sun is setting to our left. And of course that created these dramatic shadows, which is, at least visually, that's really the, if you will, the fun or the theme of of the painting is, I would say, are these dramatic shadows, especially on these two characters right here. So that's where I'm starting out with right off the bat. Let's just re-emphasize. So what I call what I'm doing right now, what I call it um, final edit or sparkle. It's really final edit, isn't it? It's a little bit too What's the word? Too broad an area to be considered just final sparkle. And of course, it doesn't matter what I call it. It's not the point, but I'm just trying to help you guys keep track of what I would, what I would call what I'm doing now. I would call it not sparkle like I did on the first one, but in fact, final edit, especially because I, I took time to do um, pencil. So a lot of that pencil needs to be pushed back. And if this is the first time you've watched me, let me quickly say that using pencils in oil painting is by no means a, a, tra a traditional thing. It is, it is not. And I, I, yes, it's old traditional to use uh, charcoal as on sketching underneath but as I hope you can detect that is not at all what I'm about here my my pencil lines first of all they come late in the process not early and secondly they're intended to be seen in the very last stages of the painting they're not they're not to be covered up anyways but that's that is very unconventional yes if you're again if you're new here you should be saying wait I didn't know we could do that well you can't <laughs> If you want to play by the rules, you can't. If you don't care about the rules, then you do whatever, do whatever you want. And that's certainly what I'm doing here. Is not worrying about the rules at all. I've been doing pencils for about, in my oil paintings, for, I forget, three or four years, something like that. So I have these brushes already mixed up with nice bright colors from from my last painting. So I'm doing that, you know, kind of speed painting kind of technique, which is how I painted this painting in the first place. Pulling out every trick I could think of to get it executed in about two hours, maybe two and a half, I don't know who's counting. I definitely want to convey the, and, and, and a, my biggest complaint about this painting as, as it was before, before I started touching up, it was just entirely too dull and dark. So I wanted to, I definitely want it to reflect the carnival colors. I actually talked about that when I was doing this painting a couple months ago, I talked about 
the 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 <laughs> philosophy of carnival, quote unquote. It's it's just it's fascinating to me. Um, I think human beings, and I think all human beings, some some are more given to uh, carnival-ish um, pursuits, but I think we all can be to some extent. Only extreme snobs, I think, would turn up their nose at all carnival. Um, I don't know if I want to get all into it now, but human beings, we, we sort of have two sides of our nature. I'm not getting into anything like good and evil, bad and good and wrong, right and wrong. I'm just talking about even in our entertainment. Um, we can... Hang on. Blue. We have a subtle and sensitive side of our nature. Now, some people, that side is buried more deeply <laughs> than others. And then we have the more blunt <laughs> uh, sledgehammer side of our sensory experience, I would say. Um, you do not go to a classical concert uh, looking for the nuance and subtle no no you don't you don't go to a rock concert looking for the sensitivity and nuance that you would experience at a concert with a string quartet to, to use a form of music that I generally detest <laughs> on re in recording anyway a, a string quartet live is okay a string quartet on the radio is a long, drawn-out death. <laughs> I don't care if it is Beethoven. And I'm, again, I'm a classic, classic music lover. <laughs> Second only to the harpsichord. <laughs> harpsichord is more like carnival shtick. <laughs> it's masquerading as, as classical music. I love it. Back in the Adams family that... that um, What's his name? The butler, what was his name? Played the harpsichord. That was a stroke of genius. That was just hilarious. And I honestly don't think that's ruined the harpsichord for me. I think the harpsichord was ruined before the Adams Family ever came on. Lurch. <laughs> that's lurch. <laughs> anyway, these colors. <laughs> that is a blunt instrument, ladies and gentlemen. This is not for... S sensi the sensitive, visually sensitive. <laughs> this is a clobber over the head. And that's okay. There's a place and a time for clobber over the head. There really is. I think the medieval madrigals that went around from village to village singing and jousting. You know, pe human beings have always done carnival-ish stuff. Now, the, and there's no question that there are some people that are way more given to the reflective I am one of those and it's take it's been a hard long journey for me learning that many people flat do not appreciate um, the meditative the slow the gentle the sensitive in in any respect whatsoever it, it, I don't know it's I'm being I'm dangerous here this is not Listen, this is not carefully premeditated. I'm just rambling about things I have thought about. But um, it seems to me like the people that are, <laughs> I'm going to be mean now, that are Neanderthals in the arena of, say, literature, like they, they cannot discern a well-turned phrase from a potato. Those same people are, tend to be not sensitive in many other respects as well. I don't know. Maybe maybe they can discern a 98 mile an hour fastball. I don't I don't know. And there. So now I'm picking on jocks. I, I am indeed. Although some some athletes are in fact very sensitive. And anyway, everybody's different. And that's, I'm not condemning any either one. 
but sometimes it is good to know who your audience is. And it's good not to try to bring the wrong product to the wrong audience. So this, <laughs> a carnival is rock and roll. <laughs> it is not a string quartet. There's nothing sensitive of what a cardinal. <laughs> Notice these subtle tones. <laughs> eh. Not. <laughs> oh boy. And again, I, I, I think most balanced human beings can do both. Not everybody can, evidently. But I, th I pride myself. <laughs> Maybe there's the problem. I pride myself. I pride myself in being able to appreciate both at various times. My wife and I were gifted this past Christmas season to go and hear um, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra do their Christmas concert. And uh, now that's kind of a hybrid, isn't it? Because it's sort of, sort of classical-ish. Um, but, <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, it's classical music, uh, you know, delivered with the subtle, all the subtlety of a canon. <laughs> you like classical music? <laughs> Be that as it may, I had a great time. <laughs> from the very first note, there was a silly smile on my face from ear to ear to the very last note. There was nobody in the place that enjoyed it more than I do. And so there you go. I liked it just fine. I liked that more than just fine. I loved it. And being a musician, I suspect I apprehended a whole lot more of what was going on than the average person. <laughs> but it was it was rock and roll. It was it was not subtle. There were some nice moments. Even like by contrast, um, Chip Davis and Mannheim Steamroller by by comparison, their their Christmas concert. Even though it has some some rocking moments, it would also have some very meditative, you know, quiet stuff. All right, I, that's I don't know where I'm going with this conversation, so I'm just going to end it right there. <laughs> Let's get back to talking about art per se, art per se. <laughs> So does that mean I'm trying to do this painting with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer? No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. Even though it's a sledgehammer subject, I'm trying to execute it with some degree of sensitivity or finesse. Can I say that? Also, with that ever, <laughs> ever conscious nod toward racial diversity. <laughs> that, is, that is the world we live in. I'm not, I, I love living in a diverse world. I don't like living in a, in a world that is racist by hypersensitivity. Um, Lots of brown in this painting. That's to, in contrast to the carnival colors, I guess. <laughs> How, how's that sound for an excuse? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that on purpose. Lots of browns to contrast the. Do you recognize BS when you hear it? <laughs> Almost done. That didn't take long. A 
I'm going to do do the same thing I did in the last painting. The last the last thing I'm going to do here is go back to my lightest lights for true sparkle here. Um, warm white, off white, whatever you want to call it. And uh, just come in and hit a few. Let's put a white hat on this kid. And I'm out of titanium white. Yes, welcome Susan, and, and yes, Barbara answered you correctly. It was three paintings on one large canvas. I am not terribly happy with this little feller down here. I'm sort of ignoring him because I, <laughs> I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Did you ever do that? <laughs> Maybe if I ignore him, he'll go away. Uh, <laughs> that always works, doesn't it? <laughs> in, in every area of life. shirt on this guy. I think, I think I've got, got carried away with the brownness of the browns in this painting. There we go. Same thing on this little guy with the yellow shirt. I like the yellow but it's just too muddy. Let's lighten it up a little bit. Just a little bit down here. All right. Oh, speaking of which, this guy right here, he's got completely the wrong colored shirt on. Mm hmm. What would happen if I gave him a pinkish shirt? Yeah, that's all right. And a blue shirt, pale blue shirt on this kid. I'm not sure I ever got around to painting the, the color on these on all these kids' clothing. <laughs> I'm feeling, feeling, wait a minute, all their clothes are brown. <laughs> Did I tell you? That's a tradition in Wilson, North Carolina. They dress all their children in brown and gray. It's a very colorful town. <laughs> better.
any place else that needs yellow? Don't answer that because I'm not going to look at your chat. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just being honest. I wish I had time, but I don't. I'm just really want to knock this painting out, get her done. Yeah, yellow hat up here. And a green hat right here. Backwards. Yeah, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> that was a nice random uh, abstract mark there. Nice accident. Okay, I do have some brushes that still have red on them, so maybe the last thing we, I'm going to do here is mix up a very pale pink a little bit of yellow to that and uh, do some quick highlights on all this red the red is just a little bit too flat too much of a good thing right there there we go I will sleep well tonight having worked on one, two, three, four, five, six paintings, I think. I think it's six. I may do one more after I hang up with you guys. There we go. Oh, there we go. That made a huge difference, didn't it? Just coming in and sparkling up that red with this pale peach and adding a little bit of letting a little bit more that, all that little random stuff uh, added an energy the, the painting was too static everything was too static and that just really helped a lot one good turn deserves another i want to do a little bit of the same thing now with the, uh, the yellows that I have. Oh, I'm in a pickle now. My, my palette is almost completely filled up. Found one little corner. I'm mixing up a very pale yellow with real yellow this time, not, not, a, not a, you know, yellow ochre, not just a warmed up yellow, but a, in fact, a an intense yellow. Again, so this is what I would call sparkle, like I was doing on the on the last painting. And I'm also practicing at least a little bit what I talked about earlier. Generally speaking, my new practice is when I put down a mark, paint with brush, I'm, go I'm, I'm assuming that most of the time I'm going to come back and mess up that mark in some way. And I'm quite sure that my painting will be the better for it. There we go. Whew! That painting took on a life 
of its own right there in just the last four minutes. You do one more thing that is uh, almost pure white. Tiny bit of warmth added to it. Um, for my lightest lights on this on this front panel right here. Perhaps you've heard me say before that um, one of the nice things about smearing your paint either with a with a finger or a brush or a brush handle or a rag or whatever, one of the nice things about doing a, a smear is that very often it, it's very easy to undo or to diminish. Like, like I'll go like this, and then if I decide it's too much, I can just take my finger or a rag and smear the smear. Does that make sense? The trail and just rub it out a little bit and that that helps free me up from being afraid to, to do those little things. I still didn't work on this little guy down here. I might do a little bit of, on him after I hang up from you guys. But I do think I'm going to quit right there. I'm really quite happy with the progress that just took place on that painting in the last several minutes. Oh, and my feet are getting sore when I stop broadcasting in a bit. Ouch! <laughs> I just dropped it on my thumb. All right, am I in the picture? I am. Let me see what you guys are saying here. Whoa. You're saying a lot. Hi, Uncle 60, I saw your name go by. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You guys are talking up a storm. There's no way I can read all this. Let me see if I can just find any of the serious colors. Oh, Lady Grammy, not feeling well. Bless you. Be well. That's an order. Thank you guys for answering each other correctly. <laughs> uh, Marie, do I have cobalt turquoise in your in your palette I do not um, I mix that by using uh, for, I don't use any cobalts I use that typically by um, using a phthalo blue and then some kind of yellow to um, make it turquoise ish because I don't want to use there is a company that makes a permanent green light Sorry, I don't know which company it was. It's the, it, not every color is the same with every company, and there's one that makes a very intense bright, not quite turquoise, but very intense light green. It's called permanent green light, and it's a very intense color. And uh, I I do like that. It's good for stoplights. I mean, go lights. <laughs> Hello, Thinker888. Uh, yes, the, thank you. I did catch that question. Thinker 888, what, what brush do I use to sign my paintings? Thank you for asking. Windsor Newton Series 7. S series 7 is not the size. That's a line of brushes. These are all Series 7. This is a size 1, 3, and 6. Any of those whole This must be a 6 miniature. Yeah. Miniature means the bristles are a little bit shorter. Uh, but Thank, thanks for asking a good question of uh, Windsor Newton Series 7. Yes. Oh, good. Uncle already asked you, answered you. <laughs> uh, and maybe you're not listening anymore. It's been a while since you asked that question. A rigger uh, works not as well as a Windsor Newton Series 7. Moraid, good to have you on board. You're very sweet. Thank you. Now, Uncle says he likes the um, Princeton Aqua 4850. Hello, Lake. <laughs> I'll check that out. I'll check that out. <laughs> Uncle, <laughs> you're supposed to develop a signature. 
<laughs> that people can read. <laughs> and Murray, do you have the same principles of transparent with, yes, with acrylics as with oils? That's exactly, good question, yes. Exactly the same principles with acrylics. And yes, we use, uh, I use a medium with my acrylics, not just water. <laughs> and and uh, uncle's complaining about my spooky kid. Maybe I should work on him when I finish, when I hang up here. <laughs> uh, oh, good. That's right. Thank you for the reminder. I need to go through my acrylic palette here soon. GAC 100 is my favorite. You're correct. 80 20, close enough. Yes. 75 20. If it depends on the quality of the acrylic that you're using. If you use rather cheap, I don't have a bottle up here, rather inexpensive fluid acrylics, then you use less medium. If you buy like a golden, high quality acrylic, then you use more medium. Um, are these all sold? No, no, the two that I'm entering into competitions are not sold. I can't sell them if you're entering in a competition. <laughs> Uncle Blunt. <laughs> Rant. Rant number 1287. You're exactly correct. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> That's Lake saying hi. Um, oh, Maureen says she used Titan Buff by Golden for her whites. That's a great idea. I need to check that out. Maureen, thank you. Titan Buff. I will try to remember that. <laughs> Susan know what it's like to ignore an entire painting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you guys are so funny. <laughs> Town dress code. <laughs> um, Uncle, does the you video go right to YouTube as you it does. Um, I have the capacity to put an SD card and record, but I almost never use it. When I first started out, I used it more, and now I virtually never used it. Um. <laughs> Ghost kids. They're saying, all my kids, like they, for a while they were all dressed in kind of brownish colors and they were saying maybe they were ghost kids. No, only the ghost kids could play and the real kids had to stand back and watch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> just laughing. <laughs> just go back and read the chats. If you're wondering what I'm laughing at, <laughs> poor Dan has to read all this. And I'm actually doing it on camera today. I don't know if... Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Somebody said, Marie says, my granddaughter is beautiful. <laughs> she, she, she is. There, is there anything you'd like to say to Moraid? Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Oh, that was fun. That was nonsense. I don't know how many people we lost while I was sitting there laughing <laughs> at your comments. But I had fun. I feel good. Internal jogging is the name of that, of that right? I will. I'm going to sit down and work on this face, but not what you guys are watching. I can't stand the pressure. <laughs> All right, it's been great fun, and it's actually been profitable. You helped me do a, improve the painting a great deal. Love you all. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>